Y'all ready with me, church? I, hey, the train's rolling. We're rolling. So you better jump on. Let's go. All right? I, uh, I was joking. Emmy gave me some electrolytes this morning. I'm like a bullet train. So good luck to all y'all. We're doing it. We're doing it. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I feel like I have to pause for a reason. really is nothing better than him. We were singing that today. There's nothing better than you. I guess what I, I, I feel in my heart is whatever is weighing on you, I pray that today you would put it in its proper place below him. There's nothing better than him looking to him, worshiping him, giving him glory and praise and doing what his word says. There's nothing better than him. When you trust him through thick and thin, through the good and the bad, it will always be for his glory and for our benefit. Amen, church? All right, here we go. Let's go for it. Disorder. What are we talking about? What are we talking about disorder? Yes, there are many mental disorders that are out there. There are many uh, things that are going on within uh, perhaps the, the world of psychology that people are able to diagnose and understand what's going on a little bit with the brain. But what we're looking at today and my framework of what we're going after with this term disorder is to look at what is going on with our mind that is out of alignment with God's word. I actually believe that if we took the Bible's approach to things and if we allowed the Word of God to transform us, as it says in His Word, to renew our mind, if we actually allowed that to happen, oh, a lot of things would look drastically different for us. And so today, I want to address these thoughts. They're out of alignment. And I, I want you all to be open to the fact that this might be me. Look to someone next to you and say, this one's for me today. This one's for me today. This one's for me today. This one's for me. Second Corinthians says it like this. And this is our scripture for the year. It says this, that we demolish every stronghold. We're destroying arguments and every arrogance, all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. We're destroying everything that goes up against him. And we're taking every thought, not the most of them, not, you know, the ones that I can control. Some will say every thought. Every thought. Every thought. I want to be free of everything that doesn't belong in there. Amen? Amen. Taking every thought and making it obedient to Christ. Hey, yes, God can do it, but just so you know, you're an active participant in that process too. You are an active participant in taking that thought and making it, bringing it to Jesus and says, this needs to submit to you today. I pray that you would make that decision. We need to combat it. It's what I'm talking about. You and I, we need to combat it. I know I'm Mr. Positive, and I know I'm like happy all the time, and I'm dancing and all that type of stuff, but I combat these thoughts every day of my life. I combat anger. I combat fear. I combat lust. All of these thoughts that wage war in my head, I want you to know that I'm with you in this battle. We combat the worldly thoughts as our mind begins to change in a heavenly way. When you give your life to Jesus, it is undeniable that we are changing our mind and it is in fact a command for you to think different. Did you know that? It is a command for you to start thinking differently. Some of us were, are negative. We'll say, I'm just being a realist. What's more real, the heavenlies or your situation? I'd I'd rather think about the things that he thinks about and consider those way more real than what I'm facing right now. So when I am jealous, I want to think about those heavenly things and actually see what is real in my life. Not what I think should be, but what, I, what, I, or what is in the heavenlies. I want to show you this. Philippians 4, this is a command for you. Hey, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is excellent, all of these things, consider these things. Think about these things. Anything that is worthy of praise, fixate your thoughts on these things. Think about those. 
Because we know that our mind can fixate and wander on this anger, this bitterness, this jealousy, this lust. We can fixate on these things all our waking moments. And you and I are commanded to think about something different now. So, I, I, and I've been saying this every week we've been in this series, this is not a toxic positivity message. This is not just some like, oh, think nice and you'll be good. This is not some manifest your kindness or manifest your awesome days. No, 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 that's not what this message is. This is just what happens when you find life in Jesus. This is naturally what happens when you find life in Christ. You're starting to think about different things. Colossians 3 says it like this. Therefore, if anyone has been raised, we got believers in the house. Any believers in the house? Good. Then you've been raised with Jesus. That means you have to be this. (laughs) This is you. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above. That's a command. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand. Set your minds. This is up to you. Active participation. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are of earth. So if you've been raised with Jesus, this is a direct command for you and for me. This is what happens to the mind now. This is how you ought to walk now. This is it. You're thinking about things that are above. Now, why are we doing this series? Because of this. There is a great danger. If you aren't setting your mind on things above, if you aren't considering what is notable, excellent, praiseworthy, if you're not fixing your mind on those things, there is a great danger in avoiding that battle and combating those thoughts. If you let the worldly flesh, the worldly thoughts persist and remain, you will find yourself in a dangerous place in very a, a multitude of various forms. For those of us who are anxious, when you think about all he's given you, when you think about that little child that he's given you, how could that anxiety persist? For all those who are depressed or down and out, when you think about that which is heavenly, when you consider the cross, when you consider his love, when you think about these things, how can that persist? It's persisting because we're choosing to fixate our thoughts on that which we shouldn't fixate on. For those who are in accord with the flesh, this is huge. I pray that this hits you today as it has hit me. This is Romans chapter 8. What is the danger? What is the danger in thinking about those old ways? For those who are in accord with the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. You will think about those evil things. You will keep on thinking about lust. You will fixate on that jealousy. You will hold that bitterness in the front of your face to the point where it makes you angry every day. You will think about those things constantly. But those who are in accord with the Spirit will consider what is of the Spirit or the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on flesh is what, church? Take the warning from Paul himself, not from me. Take the warning from the words of Jesus Christ, not from me. This is God speaking. But the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Anyone want life and peace in this room? Good, then listen up for the next, how many minutes do I got? 39 minutes and 40 seconds. If you want life and peace, consider this. Because the mind, go ahead, the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Fixating on all of these things that you don't need to fixate on. It is making your mind hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. In other words, when you fixate on these things, you will not submit to Jesus and do as he tells you to do. Let me give you an example. Today. If you're jealous of material things, my best friend has this car and this many rooms in his house. Do you know what's going to happen when you're fixating on what you don't have? When God tells you to give and give generously, what are you going to do? You're going to hold on to it. You will not subject yourself to the law or to his commands because you're fixating on your friend's five-bedroom house. 
it will not subject to God's commands. And I'm here to tell you today, as uncomfortable as it is, whatever it is that's on your heart, if you do God's commands, it will be for your benefit and for the glory of the kingdom. Always. For it's not even able to do so. It's not even able to submit to the law of God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So today, can we do some work today and address these thoughts? Because I want you to please God. And I want you to live out everything he has for you. And I want you to subject yourself to him, knowing that it's going to give you the life, life, and more life that he promises in John chapter 10. If the worldly thoughts persist, we will find that our, our mind is hostile and not heavenly. That's the word of God. If you allow it to persist, you'll find that your mind is hostile, not heavenly. Romans 12. Wrapping it up with this, okay? Romans 12 says, and do not be conformed to this world. These, there are worldly thoughts, flesh desires, worldly ways. The enemy has many schemes. And what he's saying is don't be conformed to this, but be transformed by the renewing. That's an active verb. That doesn't mean the renewed mind. The renewing mind. It's happening now. Oh, you think you can never not be angry? You think you can never not be bitter? You think you can never not be jealous? Today is a great day for the renewing mind to start. So that you may prove, hello, so that you may prove what the will of God is. So that you may see what is good, what is pleasing, and His perfect will. Church, I believe we can see this. His word says we can do it, so I believe we can. If only you would take what is a mess in here submit it to God and do what his word says do the thoughts within my mind this is the greatest question from this whole series do the thoughts within my mind withhold me from living out his will for my life I want you to consider that today are there thoughts going on in my mind that are withholding me from living out God's perfect pleasing and good will for my life is there something going on? Today is a great self-assessment day. Today is a great day to check in on the state of your mind, to really be honest. And this is hard because when you think about these things, this anger, fear, and, and jealousy, we've talked about anger, fear, and now we're going to be talking about jealousy today. We have turned a blind eye to it because if we acknowledged it, we would have to do something about it. Today is a great day to acknowledge it and do something about it. Amen? Amen? Okay. Here's the bottom line for today. A jealous mind destroys what God has given by fixating on what others have. A jealous mind, your jealousy, will end up destroying what you have been given. I cannot tell you how many people have been taken out, how many callings have been forfeited, how many people who have, quote, it all, have forfeited everything in the endeavor for what they do not have and what they have not been given. Oh, if only you would celebrate God and what he's given you. You might not destroy it. I've seen many people, can I speak transparently? I've witnessed Many pastors destroy their life over jealousy of other great churches. I have seen the endeavor to be like everyone else, rob pastors of their personality, their personal relationship with Jesus. They try to be something that they're not. They're not authentic and true to themselves, and they rob their ministry and eventually get lost. I'm not supposed to be Stephen Furtick, and I don't want to be. That's his own calling and his own thing. I'm not that. Do you know what I could do, though? I could look at Stephen's church and be like, oh, all of his seats are full and here I am and I'm trash. Maybe I should start speaking like Stephen. And I could compromise everything I can believe in. And then what ends up happening is when I start with that jealousy, I look at someone like Aaron and I don't actually value Aaron. I just value a full seat. And I lose my love for people. No, I'm being serious. I lose my love and my regard for people. And I end up destroying the care and the community that we've built. I'm trying to show you guys that if you are jealous, you will destroy what you have. If you're in marriage and you're like, oh, well, that man treats his wife like this. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to start destroying your marriage. Oh, this business operates this way. Man, I wish I could be like that and make this much money. And you're going to start compromising on your biblical principles. 
and you're going to start destroying your business or you're going to go in a route led by the enemy and his principles. I'm trying to show you today that if you're not aware of the jealousy within, you will take everything and God has given you so much. If anything today, I want you to recognize that God has given you breath in your lungs. It begins right there. But with jealousy, you will take everything you have and destroy it because you want what someone else has. I cannot wait to show you. I cannot wait to show you this biblical account. We'll get there. But please remember, you will take everything you have and destroy it. Do you know what you have? Do you regularly sit back and recognize what you have? And then do you acknowledge where it comes from? Because a lot of us, yeah, that's right. A lot of us, though, will say, it's been my work. I've worked hard. I've earned this. You can even get arrogant within your marriage. Babe, hey, I, I want you, babe. What's up? You start getting arrogant. I could easily get in here and be arrogant about this new space. Do we recognize what we have? And the more important part of this question is where it comes from. Each of you have many different giftings, resources, time, every bit of it. God has given you so much. Different family dynamics, different relationships, work, all of this stuff. You have been given so much. Do you recognize that church? And do you recognize that it comes from Him? There's this scripture that's quoted quite often uh, and, and you'll, you'll hear, and my God, you know, you really, and my God will supply all your needs, right? Go ahead, put this up here, Philippians 4. My God will supply all your, someone say needs, needs, folks. Not wants, needs. I want an amusement park in my backyard. Jesus is like, yeah, you ain't got room for that dog, it ain't gonna happen. My God will supply all your needs. And this is a great uh, I, I believe that often this is taken out of context and used for prosperity. Pause. I do believe that God will absolutely bless you abundantly at all times. I really do. Because he's so generous and he's so good. You will have everything that you need. God just is so, he throws all of his favor and his riches on his children for what you need. For what you need. So I'm not shy of saying that God will bless and God will pour favor into I'm not shy of saying that. But I don't want to use this scripture as a manipulative tool to go and preach wealth and prosperity. So he'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. His riches and glory are never ending. That's how much he can fulfill, right? Now to God our Father the glory, not to us be the glory, to God our Father the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we love this verse. This verse has been preached so much. This verse, it's about abundance. But I want to give you some context. Did you know that this comes immediately after being content? It's not just about prosperity, prosperity, having everything I want, everything I need all the time. Bye, bye, bye. God gives me all that. I get everything I want. No, actually this verse comes right after verses centered on being content. Someone say content. It's a hard word in our world today. The American way is to pursue whatever makes you happy and to go for it and get it and acquire it. To go 100%. I actually think that while yes, I agree with those core principles of freedom, I actually believe the pursuit of the material can be quite damaging to the faith walk. The pursuit of what you don't have or what God has not given you can actually be deadly to what God has given you. We're not very content. We want the better car, the better job. We want our spouse to fulfill our needs and to be better at it. We're not easily content, are we? I would venture to say that actually a lot of your frustration in life might boil down to the fact that you're not content with where you're at. How do you go fly across an ocean, 
land on a continent where people have nothing, yet there's contentment and joy. How? How is depression so overwhelming here? Anxiety is so overwhelming here when we can walk down that street to Jersey Mike's and get a full sandwich that feeds four but feeds just a Nick Miller. How are we upset? How are we miserable? Not only that, they said, we want you to be more content. You can order online and we'll deliver it right to your house. And these people walk 5,000 miles to a well with a bowl on their head early in the morning and take it all the way back. How are you not content? And I'm speaking to myself now. Do you know what you've been given? You have a car. These people don't have modes of transportation. They don't have legitimate roads even. Do you understand what I'm getting at, church? For a world that has everything, we're very, we lack a lot of contentment. So we want the abundance, we want the abundance, and we want the abundance, and we forget to be content with all that we have. Look at what Paul says. Go ahead, you can put this up here. This is in Philippians 4, that same chapter, 11. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned. Someone say learned. This is a learned behavior, a learning to be content. I think if we talk about the human condition, we're going to want more, 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 more. Do you guys understand that? When you go to a little, you want evidence of that? If you went to my son Warren and you said, Warren, here's one chocolate, one little piece of Hershey Kisses. He devours that thing in one second. Do you want another one? Yep. Do you want another one? Yep. And that kid will eat a whole bag because our natural flesh wants more. Do y'all see that, church? We want more. For I have learned to be content. Church, I want to challenge you today to embrace learning how to be content. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little. I also know how to live in prosperity. So no matter where you're at, you can still have this mind attitude. You can still walk this way and be content. Go ahead. I also know how to live in prosperity in any and everything. Nope, go back to that so I can go read that. Yep, yep, yep. Back to it. In any and everything um, circumstances, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. This is part of our course. Go ahead. Then comes that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. To be content. To know that he is your source and he can do it all. So we need to learn about being content in all season. It is a learned behavior. Contentment is a learned heart posture and a a, a pattern of the mind. Church, you have to learn it. Is it bad to want more, Nick? Not in excess. Of course we want to grow things. Let me ask you something. Should we want to grow our church and to reach more people? That's a healthy thing. So not all more is terrible. But when more is the focus above Jesus Christ, that is where you get tripped up. To be content, it's a learned heart posture. It comes from a heart, oh my goodness, I love this. It comes from a heart that's encountered the provider. I'm being serious. When you've encountered Jesus and you know how he takes care of everything, when you understand that you can bring any burden to him and he can bear the burden and he can care for you, if even the sparrows are fed are fed, and he can care for you, how much more valuable are you when you encounter your provider, when you encounter this Jesus, this contentment can finally come in. And I'm here to tell you that without encountering the provider, contentment is going to be really hard to find. You will always have a void of want without walking with him. Always. And I would actually venture to say that my seasons of wanting are often indicative of a season where I am far and have wandered off. It comes from a heart that encounters and walks with the provider. James 3 says it like this. Now we're going to talk to jealousy. Someone say, "Uh uh-oh. 
Hey, here we go. This is the big stuff. Jealousy. Go ahead. But if you have bitter jealousy, we've talked about contentment. That's pretty much the opposite of jealousy. So if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and what? Demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, this is not my words. Remember, I talked to you. I was telling you, if we don't address this, we will destroy things. Where jealousy exists, there will be disorder, literally the title of our series. There will be disorder in every evil thing. Do you see why we need to address this today? wish I could have my person too. I look at them all the time. I'm jealous. When's my breakthrough coming? When's my miracle coming? When's what I want going to be in my bank account? When's my new job coming? We get so jealous and there enters evil practices at that place. Every evil thing. Jealousy is of the flesh and will create disorder and will lead to vile. Other translations, if you're reading NIV, it says vile practices. I just think it emphasizes the horrible nature of that. The severity of the need to get rid of jealousy. Do you recognize that it resides within, my friends? Do you have a jealous heart? Mind flooded with jealousy and envy and greed. I want to look at the the Greek word that was used here for jealousy in James chapter 3. The Greek word is zelos, uh, which is really cool because it's almost a double meaning. Zealous and jealous. This word actually is interchangeable with like zeal that is used within the word of God. And I think that that's very fitting. Now when we're talking about zeal, it talks about Uh, this need to engage, that you're so bought in and committed that you are driven to action. Someone say, driven to action. That's what zeal is. When you're so passionate and zealous for Jesus, you're driven to action. You have to tell everybody about the gospel. When you're so jealous or zealous for Jesus, you have to go and do what he tells you to do. Now, in the same breath, when you're jealous, it has that same implication that you are committed to action and a contentious rivalry that I am going to be so opposed to you because I'm jealous. Now, we don't want to say it because then someone would say you're jealous and they would stop being around us or they would just dismiss us. So we don't say it out loud. But that jealousy actually makes you a rival. It instills a rivalry heart and a mindset. The envy within robs us of regard for people and instills in us a regard only for the material. So again, whenever we were talking earlier, if I have this jealousy and this envy of great men and and preachers and teachers in the word, and I have this great envy within me, I will rob myself of regard or love for people, and I will value only what they can bring, only what they can provide me, only what they have. Does that make sense, church? Does that make sense, church? I have seen many people just hang out with people because of their wealth. They don't actually care for and love that person. They just get them in a nice Steeler game box. They have no regard for the person. They have only regard for the material, only regard for that which they don't have. It will rob you of love for people. That's what it will do. Philippians 2, 3, and I wanted to show you the vice versa. And remember, he says, where there's selfish ambition and jealousy, there will be every evil thing. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. My final landing question is this. How can we walk just like Jesus and yet allow jealousy to remain within? How can you do that? How can you consider others more valuable and and, and more worthy than yourself when you are jealous and envious of everything that they have? 
Church, you will not be able to live out the command that's set before you with jealousy in the mind. Do y'all catch that today? I want to show you more proof today. If you got your book, we're going to go to it. We're going to Genesis chapter 4. It's funny, I actually haven't preached about this account here in church yet, and here we go. First time through. We're going to be talking about Cain and Abel. If you're unfamiliar with the, the account, this is the beginning of creation. God created the whole, everything that you see, everything that you feel, everything that's in here. He created it all. Man and woman, he said it was good. And then, woman took of the apple and, well, the apple, the fruit, and so did man, and they fell and they were removed from the Garden of Eden. And now we see Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. And uh, this story, I want you to remember, someone say remember, that we destroy everything we've been forgiven, or that we've been given. We destroy everything that we've been given. In this account, we see a brother let jealousy He lets jealousy lead to vile practices. He does something horrendous. And if you've never read this account, I can't wait to jump into it with you because I want to show you the power that jealousy can really have. Let's jump into it. Now we're in in verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man, talking about Adam, had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have obtained a male child with the help of the Lord. So here comes Cain. He's the older brother. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the flocks. Someone say, keeper of the flocks. Say it with me, keeper of the flocks. And Cain was a cultivator of the ground. Someone say cultivator of the ground. I think it's very interesting here. I want you to remember their assignment. Abel was to take care of, and he was given, someone say given. He was given the flocks, and Cain was given the ground. Both Cain and Abel... Upon being born and God having great plans for them, you can put this up here. Both Cain and Abel have been given giftings, tasks, and resource. Church, this is the same for you. You have been given giftings, tasks, and resources. You are so different than me. You are so positioned differently by God than me. I love this. There are so many different gifts in this room today, church. There are people who are gifted with business. There are people who are gifted to sing. There are people who are gifted as organizers. They know how to make a nice, clean closet. Seriously, that's a gifting. Uh, There are people who are gifted to make some yummy food. Oh, come on. There are people with so many giftings. There are people who are gifted to teach. There are people who are gifted to share the gospel. There are so many different giftings in this room. Different resources, different tasks. All of us. But I want you to take note that Cain was to cultivate the ground and Abel was to keep the flocks. Total different callings. Sometimes in the church, especially, we want someone else's calling and we can get jealous of what others are doing. I would actually venture to say that in modern church culture, a lot of the way that it's oriented and and taught is value only for a microphone and nothing else. And I think that's so destructive to church culture it's not about one person and it's not about one skill set I've seen many a churches be built around one personality type and that's not it that's not it we all have a part to play we're all one body amen church some of us are the hands some of us are the legs we're all different and these two brothers they're different given different tasks so it came about go ahead you can keep going so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground he was worshiping he recognized God I know what I've been given now I'll give it back to you it was an act of worship it was actually something that was intended to be a gracious and good thing And I think that especially in the church, we can get this way too. A heavenly offering, I wrote this down. A heavenly offering is going to turn into a materialistic heart posture. 
So he brings something from the ground. He says, God, this is yours. I give it to you. Go ahead. Have your way with it. And what's going to end up happening when he witnesses someone else's worship, when he witnesses someone else's giving, when he witnesses someone else's gifting and task and resource, he's going to start getting jealous. This heavenly thing is about to turn into a very material problem, and jealousy is going to lead to vile things. Track with me. Abel now. He comes in. And I want to teach you something really quick. I really do believe in the... um, And the power of first fruits, not because you, how do I describe it? Not because none of the other stuff matters. When you bring your first fruit, it's a heart posture that says you're my first and my my only thing that I'm leaning on. It's proof to yourself. It's proof of your heart posture. What comes out first? That's what you value the most, right? So Abel on his part brought an offering. And he brought it from the firstborn. Someone say firstborn. So he was tending the flocks, and the first lamb that came out, he gave it. The first calf he gave, he brought from the firstborn, the top, not the leftovers. He brought the firstborn. He brought their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. It's not about money to God. It's it's about heart posture. It's not about what you can give. It's about heart posture. Church, we say this all the time. It's not about what happens. It's about the condition of the heart. Amen, church? And so what Abel said is he said, my condition of my heart trusts you first and acknowledges you first above all things. Now, instead of Cain learning from this and being inspired by his heart posture, something happened. But before we press further, I want you to be honest. You and I in the church can often compare and envy acts of worship. We can envy one another. Even in the church, we're supposed to be brothers and sisters. You're the hand, I'm the leg. We're supposed to be working together, and yet there can be envy even residing within us. I cannot tell you how many worship teams I've seen fall apart because there's envy of one worship leader to another. What if, we, if we all owned our parts, it's pretty amazing. So we can compare even in the church. Please, please, as you're hearing this message, don't think that, you're, um, that this doesn't apply to you. No, this message is for us, the church. Amen? So what did Cain do? Very short sentence that has a lot of implication. He became very angry, and his face was gloomy. He saw his brother was received, and he was angry, gloomy, jealous. You have a choice here, Cain. You have a choice to see this beautiful offering. You have a choice here. And you are going to choose anger and you're going to fixate on this jealousy. You're going to fixate on what has happened when really I want to offer the other side. Can I show you what I hope and pray that we would all do if we were in Cain's spot? Instead of celebrating, someone say celebrate. Instead of celebrating his brother's faithfulness, Cain would then become his greatest threat with this anger and this jealousy. We could celebrate one another. I would, I would venture to say that actually celebrating one another gives no room for jealousy to come in. It crushes it. It crushes it. Instead of celebrating and saying, wow, Abel, you are, your heart's right. My goodness, how powerful is that? He allows this jealousy. He fixates on it all the time. And the story progresses pretty quickly. The account goes pretty quick. You'll see. Then the Lord said to Cain, And God calls it out. I'm here to tell you today, I pray that the Holy Spirit right now, in the similar way that Cain is being talked to by God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would talk to you like this right now. Why are you angry? I pray the Holy Spirit would say that to you right now. Why are you jealous? Why are you angry? Why are you feeling that? Why have you held on to that this long? Why are you walking with this jealousy every day? Why is your face gloomy? God says to him, if you do well, 
<laughs> will your face not be cheerful? Choose to celebrate. Choose to think about heavenly things. Choose to do what the Word tells you to do. If you do well, will you not be cheerful? Here's the warning. If you do not do well, if you don't fix this jealousy and this anger right now, somebody say right now. If you don't fix it right now, if you don't put it up right now, if that jealousy needs to be put up on that board right now, if you don't address this right now, somebody say right now. If you don't do it right now, sin is waiting at the door for you. Sin is lurking at the door, and this is crazy. Its desire is for you. It wants you. Just so you know, this jealousy wants you. This sin wants you. But you, not him, someone say me. I must master it. Yes, it's up to you today. If that jealousy persists and you're that angry and you're that envious, it is up to you. Sin is lurking at the door. You must master it. Amen, church. You have a choice today, right now. You have a choice. Please put this up here. You have a choice to let this jealousy master you and it desires to do so. It wants it so bad. It wants you to stay in that pattern forever and ever. It wants you. It wants you. The enemy knows that if you could just hold on to this jealousy more and more, that he's going to got you wrapped up around his finger and he'll make you do some vile things. So, God was honest with him. And I pray that the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I pray that you would hear how honest he is with you today. If you don't change, sin is lurking. The account goes on. We don't know how many days. We don't know if it's years. We just know what happens next. Cain then talked to his brother. And it happened that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and he killed him. Nick, I would never kill anybody. That's okay, because Jesus said if you hate a brother, you have killed him in your heart. Please be careful trying to justify. Oh, I haven't done it with my hands. Just so you know, God knows everything that's going in, on in here. His word says that he knows the words of your tongue before you even speak. And then, and then don't be so prideful and judge Cain when we're pretty capable of some vile and wicked things. Don't judge this man. We're pretty capable of some maniacal things. I guess what I want to say about this jealousy is if you leave it unaddressed, if you don't challenge it, if you don't get it out, if you don't change your ways, if you don't embrace the renewed mind or renewing mind, unaddressed, this jealousy will lead to evil practices. It will. I pray today that you would learn from Cain and put it up on that wall immediately. You don't need to walk any further with it. I would even venture to say, and this is a hard thing to admit, how many vile things have you done from this jealousy? How many words of gossip? How many harmful things have you even said to their face? What things have gone in here that have been hateful? What practices have you done with your hand to try getting more that were not heavenly? I would venture to say that you've probably done vile and evil practices. Today is the day to stop it. Unaddressed, it will lead to evil practices. And if you're in denial, please, I pray that you would learn from Cain. Then the Lord came up to Cain and said, hey, where's Abel? Didn't he do that into the garden too? Where are you guys at? Where are you guys at? Where are you guys at? He knows what's going on. Do you know what he's doing here? Remember what I said earlier in the message that where there is jealousy, there will be no regard for people but only for the material? He has no regard for his own brother. What, am I my brother's keeper? I don't care about that guy. I'm not in charge of him. He turned. He said, where's Abel? He said, I don't know. I'm, am I my brother's keeper? The jealousy, I wrote this down, the jealousy robbed Cain of any regard for his brother. I want to tell you this, that love for people and jealousy cannot coexist. You can try convincing yourself, but it is a false counterfeit love that only desires and wants what they have. And you can kind of be in the same room, but true heavenly love cannot coexist within a jealous mind. It can't. It 
it can't. It can't happen. What am I, my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. God knew. God knew exactly what happened. I, I, I'm hearing your brother. And I said it earlier, and I'll say it again. What have you done? This account is shocking. Oh, my gosh, how could he kill his brother? Again, what I want to say to you today is never underestimate the human condition. We can do some pretty evil things. I want you all to check your heart today. What's going on inside? Never underestimate what can really come out of us. We're broken. And this jealousy is a flesh thing. It's in accord with the flesh. It needs to be in accord with the Spirit of God. We need to change this. Don't underestimate the human condition. Some pretty crazy things can happen. Now also remember what I said, is that when you fixate on what others have, you destroy what God has given you. This part blew my mind. What was Cain's job? Does anyone remember? He was the cultivator of the grounds. Cultivator of the grounds. Look at what was destroyed. Now you are cursed from the ground. He destroyed what he had. Oh, I've made you in charge of the ground. Now the ground is destroyed. Which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a wanderer and a drifter from the earth. Or on the earth. The, culture, the cultivator of the ground destroyed what was entrusted to him. Go ahead. Cain destroyed what was entrusted to him. I see my brother's flocks and I have destroyed my ground. As he allowed jealousy to remain towards his brother, he would end up destroying what God has entrusted him. Church, what has he given you? Has he given you a beautiful family? Has he given you a peaceful home? Has he given you friends and relationships? Has he given you a car? Has he put food in your refrigerator? What has he given you? He's given you all these tasks, these skills and these giftings, these businesses, these jobs. What has he given you? And I'm going to tell you, just like Cain, if you focus on this jealousy, you're going to destroy everything that he's given you. You're going to destroy everything he's given you. Cain said to the Lord, and it kind of wraps up like this. Go ahead, you can put this up here. He said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to endure. Behold, you have driven me this day. You know what's crazy is jealousy will happen. The action will happen. We'll regret it, but we can't go back because jealousy and pride go hand in hand. They do. They go hand in hand. So we can't go back. I'm just going to leave. After the heinous things I've done, after the evil things I've done, I'm just done with it. You've driven me this day from the face of the ground. Go ahead. And uh, I've hidden your face. I will be a wanderer and a drifter on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. He's like, hey, I'm just good to go now. After this heinous act and what I've done, I'm so ashamed and so guilty, I just want to be out. So the Lord said to him, hey, I'm going to put a mark on you. You're not going to be killed. Just so you know, I'm going to protect you. Your punishment is too great to endure. Behold, uh, you've driven me this day. No, 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 keep going. Uh, then the Lord said to him, therefore, uh, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him seven times as much. And the Lord placed on a mark on Cain so that no one finding him would kill him. Then Cain left the presence. Someone say he left the presence. This is where jealousy leads. Can I, oh, you ready for me to say something crazy? More than killing his brother, this is the greatest tragedy. He left his presence. Separated forever. This is what will happen when jealousy persists. I, 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 I want to summarize this whole account in, in Genesis 4 by saying this jealousy at its extreme at its extreme will lead us away from the presence of God entirely you will walk away for how could for how could you be near and yet take for granted what he has given 
in the simplest of forms, let's say uh, I got Warren a Christmas present and he was angry about it because it's not what he wanted. How could he be near and lovey-dovey and all oh, gushy Warren with me when he is hating what I've just given him? Do you understand that those two can't exist? Do you know that, right? It doesn't make sense. That relationship will be tense in a weird way. So he left. He left the presence of God. This is where jealousy can't take you if it's left unaddressed. So I want to leave you with this. Um, how do we win? Because we talked about contentment being learned. How do we defeat the jealousy within? First of all, we have to submit to God. Today, if there's anyone with jealousy, I want to pray with you. I want, to, I want you all to come up at the end of this. I want to pray with you against this jealousy. Can we do that today? Can you be honest with yourself today and know that your brothers and sisters are lifting you up? Not in a, nobody's going to judge you for coming up. Nobody's going to hate you for coming up. We're going to be standing with you so that you would be set free of this hold that might pull you away. So first, I think we just need to bring it to God. We need to submit it. But what can you do in your time? Because contentment is a learned thing. Amen, church? Y'all, y'all saw that. It's a learned thing. I'm going to say this. The greatest antidote to jealousy is gratitude. That's it. So, uh, can you get out your phones? And I want you to write nine things right now that you're grateful for. Can you do that? Nine things. That's not a lot. No, I'm being serious. Nine things. I'm thankful for my little boy. I'm thankful for my beautiful little girl, my healthy baby that's coming. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful for that silly rental car. That stupid deer hit my car. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for my insurance that covered me. I'm thankful that I had a wonderful week with my parents and my family. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for this building. I'm thankful for everybody in these chairs. I'm thankful for all of the people in this room. I'm thankful for this family that I get to call or this church that I get to call family. I'm thankful for these soft chairs. I'm thankful for this podium that my dad made. I'm thankful for all of it. I'm thankful for our safety team that's back there just backing me up. Thank you, guys. I'm thankful for my friend back here, Britt, who's helping me with this. I'm thankful for our tech team. Thank you, Jace. I'm thankful for Cafe. I'm thankful for Tim. I'm thankful for Wendy. I'm thankful for my mom. I'm thankful for every... How's that feel talking about this? I could go all day. I'm thankful for my spot on the couch. (laughs) It's my spot. Nine things. How could you be jealous when you got those nine things? nothing else. He's given you such great things. Wow. You destroy jealousy with gratitude. So I wanted to propose one last thing. There was, there's a Bible, uh, a, a parable that, that Jesus says. It's about the, the faithful servants. And now this account, this parable doesn't really talk about gratitude, but I, I want to ask a question in the midst of this account. I want to show you this. Go ahead, Matthew chapter 25. We're wrapping up with this thought. Matthew chapter 25, the master goes on a journey and he leaves, uh, he calls his servants and he entrusts them to his property. He gives them, someone say give. He gives them something. And they're all in various degrees. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. And each according to his ability. And then he went away. Um, Do you know that when people, like imagine them standing in a row. Thank you for my five. Thank you for my two. Thank you for my, well why did he get five, Right? There is so much room in this account for jealousy. Go ahead, put this up there. Of course there would be room for jealousy. But I want to ask you, do you think that a heart of gratitude would squander God's gift? Do you think that a heart and a mind full of gratitude would squander God's gift? So let me give you an example. To the one who had two, instead of saying, 
Why did I get two? Oh my gosh, you got all this. Oh, I'm just so upset. I, I don't even know what to do with this. And I'm so frustrated. And I just wanted five just like this other guy. How do you think he's going to treat the two? Let me make it more um, personal. Instead of getting the 2023 Ferrari, you got the 2002 Honda Civic. Whoa, track with me now. Now I want to ask you about the condition of your 2002 Honda Civic. If you walk up to it every day saying, this stupid door doesn't work right, I have to roll down the windows, I just hate every second of this, and oh, it's not even leather seats, and you're complaining, how would you treat your car compared to if you walked out your door, you said, God, thank you for that red thing that works and gets me from point A to point B. Thank you, God, for covering me when I didn't understand. Thank you, God, for providing this for me so that I can get to work and have a great job. How are you going to treat your car? One person is going to slam that door every day and be upset, the other one's going to give it a nice little car wash every other week. You're going to honor it, and you're going to treat it well. I know that this is an implication in the story, but I would ask you, if these servants had jealousy, do you think that it would destroy what they have been given? Of course it would destroy what they have been given. And for the ones that had gratitude, of course it would edify the way that you would build it. See, what I want you to receive today is I want you to receive that you will hear good and faithful servant, well done, good and faithful servant at the end of your days. But you will not hear that if you have jealousy in your heart, but you will if you walk with gratitude over the two, the five, or the one that you've been given. Go ahead, wrap this up, Matthew 25. And he who had two talents... The guy who had the 2002 Honda Civic said, I love my car, God. Thank you for my car, God. Thank you for everything. I'm going to treat the, oh, thank you, God. Gets me from point A to point B. Gets me into my work and lets me pick up my children. When you treat it like that, I believe that you'll receive well done, good and faithful servant. But if you treat it with jealousy, I think you might hear, depart from me, you wicked, lazy servant. Didn't Cain receive that? Get away. You're not in my presence anymore. I guess I would say it like this. When there's gratitude in the mind, there will be faithful hands. Go ahead, put this up here. I pray that y'all remember that. When there's gratitude in the mind, there will be faithful hands. And you will receive and you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So what have you been given that is an absolute blessing? Your children, your home, your car, your finances, your resource, your job. Yeah, it might be tough, but you got a job. How beautiful is that? You've been given a church family. You've been given a, a wonderful spouse. Problems and all, it's wonderful. Trials and all. It's wonderful. Oh, children. Oh, they can test you in every way possible. We got two twins right there. You ever watch two twins? I'm sure it's crazy. I'm sure they haven't slept in about nine months. When there's gratitude in the mind, there will be faithful hands. Amen, church? I want to wrap up one last time just reminding you. Go ahead. Put this up here. Yep. A jealous mind destroys everything that God has given by fixating on what others have.